this is going to be nice. We've known this man for a long, long time. Yes. Fascinating. Yeah. And there's a, a new documentary uh, featuring his life and the world of uh, magic and sleight of hand and illusion. It's a wonderful compilation. Nice. He is the subject of that documentary. It's entitled Deceptive Practices, The Mysteries and Mentors of Ricky Jay. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is, Ricky Jay. Ricky, I have so many uh, questions uh, to ask you. Uh, I enjoyed the documentary. I thought it was wonderfully entertaining and dense with fascinating information. Give us now, in your opinion, the state of magic in the world today. Is it better than ever? Is it uh, where it's always been? Is it less than it's always been? Where is it? It's different than it's ever been. And I think the reason for that is the accessibility of magic techniques on the internet. Mm. So that makes it very different. In my day, magic was really a closed shop. Right. And the way you learned was from someone who taught you. Right. Sort of like the uh, sensei student relationship mm -hmm. in the master in, in the martial arts. Right. You literally did that. And the reason I moved to Los Angeles from my home in New York was to be with Di Vernon, who was the great sleight of hand man of his era. I used Charlie to hear Miller. about Di Vernon when I was uh, living in Los Angeles, worked at the Magic Castle. And Charlie Miller, who you mentioned, and, and hold an equal regard, right. uh, what I didn't realize, this man was from my hometown of Indianapolis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. isn't that great? That's really Fantastic. Yeah. And these guys meant everything to you. Everything. Mm -hmm. They were superb. They never charged you for lessons. They never asked anything of you other than to care about with the, the, their information it's about. It's a really you? interesting thing. They they were often real game players, in terms. Well, I shouldn't. I should say Vernon was a game player. Vernon had many people move to Los Angeles to study with him. Mm -hmm. uh, your friend Jeff Altman came from Syracuse. David Roth came from New York. John Carney came from Des Moines. Steve Freeman came from Oklahoma. He kind of made happy pilgrims of us all. We literally transported ourselves to be with these people who were so great. And sometimes Vernon would play the acolytes off against one another. Mm -hmm. Charlie never did that, but he was less accessible. Yeah. And, and uh, it, with Las Vegas now, and uh, everyone is familiar with Siegfried and Roy and uh, David Copperfield and on and on. Are these guys, uh, Penn and Teller have big acts, are these guys uh, good for magic? Is it, is it really magic or is that illusions? Is there, what is it? Well, difference? it's very different than sleight of hand. I yeah. mean, certainly these big illusion shows are different than sleight of hand. Uh, Penn and Teller are capable of some very sophisticated things, and uh, Siegfried and Roy and Copperfield do nice things, right. but it's, it's very different than the world that, that I uh, Has that, that, I grew that changed up in. the expectation that people have of magicians? I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, in the film, there's a great uh, segment where they uh, suddenly we're talking to a guy from, I think, from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, <laughs> right. uh, who is teaching you in a, a rarefied form of martial arts. Uh, and he had seen an illusion or a uh, sleight of hand that you had done where you take two $1 bills, whoop, whoop, and out comes a single $2 bill. Right. And he was so baffled by this that uh, but for months and months of hectoring you about how it was done, he follows you into the shower. <laughs> and he says, he says, here are two $1 bills. Do it for me now. And you, according to this guy, did it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now... How, how did you do it? The way I analyzed it was it was the quickest way to get him out of the it's shower. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, is that true? Is that possibly true? Well, yes. I, I mean, I thought it was funny. I, I had lost track of him. He was a sheriff in Los Angeles. Yeah. And these wonderful filmmakers, uh, uh, Molly Bernstein, Alan Edelstein, tracked him down to God knows where, and he was still carrying the $2 bill in his wallet. Yeah, you, I, done, uh, you guys were all at lunch, and you said, who's got a dollar bill, who's got a dollar bill, and then bingo, uh, abracadabra, zippo, it becomes a $2 bill. Right. I understand that at right, lunch. Right. I don't understand it in the shower. Well. <laughs> Actually, Vernon was known to have performed something rather remarkable in a shower as well. well, well no, wait a minute. <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> well, no, but, I, not as 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 but honestly, <laughs> now you had no idea the guy is following you into the shower, or or did you say hey, later if you're not busy, come by the shower? <laughs> How was that possible? Uh, Don't tell me how the trick was done. Just tell me how it was possible. You know, I wake up on alternate days in my life thinking I'm the unluckiest guy in the world and the luckiest guy in the world. Yeah. And I think this proves I'm a little closer to the luckiest no, guy in the well, world. No, well. I yeah. mean, I, I just, yeah. Uh, could you do it now if you and I were taking a shower? <laughs> well, I... <laughs> <laughs> It would be hard to say no. Yeah. 
I think we got a little magic going here. <laughs> There's uh, wonderful uh, archival footage in this uh, documentary of, of you as a, a kid. Tricky Ricky, your oh, grandfather, God. was a, a lover of uh, magic. Absolutely. And in, in one case, we see you put a uh, supposedly a rabbit or a hamster or something into a can, a container, and you sort of clumsily, as a kid might do, turn it upside down, and then you pull out from that a, a dove. Now, that's not sleight of hand, strictly speaking, is it? No, that's terrible magic performed by a child. <laughs> <laughs> but that's an illusion, right? Um, if, if you want to benight it with such a word, yeah. okay. I, uh, yeah. I, and, I, and I was terrible at that age. Well, no, I, no you, I, were, I, you were fine for what it is. But now, and then we see you when uh, you were throwing cards. Right. Uh, 52, you know, card, danger, cards, dangerous. Uh, cards as weapons, cards my as first weapons. book, right. right. And uh, you're, you're firing them into various things, and they pierce and they stick. But now, that's not... A sleight of hand either, is it? Well, that's a skill. A skill, yeah. A skill, yeah. right. And uh, at one point, I think it was Di Vernon, yes. challenged you to catch 40, you would throw cards in the air and catch 40 of them at once. Or not at once, but in a row. Well, he challenged me to boomerang them and have them come back to my hand 40 right. times Right, which was row. also a skill that you had taught yourself. Right. Yeah. yeah. Now, what happened when you did that? Well, he, he promised to give me a beautiful illusion, the secret to an illusion, mm -hmm. sleight of hand illusion that had me fooled. And he said when he was a kid, he practiced over and over and he could never do it 40 times. He'd do it 38 times or 39 times. And uh, he picked a dark place for me to do it in, which I think was part of his bad So his well. point was in teaching yourself a skill, it's difficult to go beyond 39 repetitions. In this particular case, yeah. yeah. So I had done it 39 times, and I, I had bet him $100 against the, uh, the illusion that yeah. I wanted to learn. And I had uh, the 40th card in my hand. So again, you throw it out, and it comes back to you, you catch it. Well, the 40th time I caught it behind my back, because I was a 20-year-old kid who was yeah. an idiot. I mean, <laughs> again, I actually risked losing this wonderful secret because I was so cocky. And it's, what, one of the other things that I loved about the, uh, the film is your discussion of the pleasure and the peace that comes from uh, sitting down with a deck of cards and, as you say, for a couple of hours and going through your various uh, manipulations, maneuvers, and whatever. It, it really brings you a source of deep pleasure, really, doesn't it? Yeah, I have to say that that's absolutely true. You, it, it almost becomes a meditative tool mm -hmm. to shuffle the cards for more than two or four or six or eight hours, ten hours a day. But it's not the best way to practice. Charlie was the guy who made me think about refining practice. But that feeling is truly wonderful, a really comfortable mm -hmm. feeling. Now, w will we see uh, an illusion or a sleight of hand maneuver here tonight? If you'd like to. Yes, sure. Oh, uh, sure. I'll get a Uh, if, if I were to frisk you, would I find birds? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps that's why my best performance has been in the He's shower. In the shower, yeah. <laughs> All right, what, what are we going to see? And, and are, uh, are there the equivalent of a, a Di Vernon and Charlie Miller now? I guess that would be yourself. No, 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 it wouldn't. If I lived to be 190, it Is wouldn't. that right? But these guys were just remarkable on a level. But Before, I'm just so lucky to... Well, let's see, the, we have a clip from the old Ed Sullivan show. What is that going to be? Oh, I'm so pleased. Yeah, one of the mentors that I worked with was a fellow named Al Flasso. Mm -hmm. And Al Flasso uh, had a magic shop at 34th and 8th Avenue uh, by, by uh, the train station. And he, he was maybe five foot one. He barely came over the counter, which was filled with clutter and memorabilia. But he was a great magician, and he worked on the Ed Sullivan Show in this very theater. Mm -hmm. He was known as the Coney Island Faker. And you know how hard it was, legendarily, to make Ed laugh. Watch Al Flasso okay. and... This is from... And, uh, took place right and, here in this theater yeah. on this stage. Yeah. So now from the circus lots, Professor Al Flasso. I remember him making Ed Sullivan truly laugh, which was uh, almost unheard of. Now coming up here, I'll show them how this is done. All you have to do is reach up in the air and get all you want. Grab one in a can. That's good. <laughs> the other hand in a can. That's better blow it in before you lose it. Put your hand on board and get this. Grab one, put it in your pocket. Keep that for coming up here. I don't care for money. Did you get it? Let's see. Okay. 
That's what I thought. Throw that game with both hands. You don't see that sort of thing much, do you? Not these days. All right. I'm sorry to have uh, waylaid us here. Let's see what we can do. Um, well, I have a deck of cards. There's a surprise. Can, mm -hmm. can I ask you to uh, give him a shuffle? I'll do what I can. That's great. He right. said he didn't have no money. <laughs> Flasso is just a... From the Isle of Malagula. <laughs> what I want to show you is kind of the difference between what a gambler would do and a, and a magician would Have do. you ever gambled with your skills? What I'd like to do is show you the difference between a gambler would do and a magician would do. So that's great. Right there. That's, that's and, a pretty good uh, shot. And I'm going to ask you as I do this to just say stop at any point. Okay. Can you see a card? I can. Oh, you want to stop there? That's fine. Can you show? No, you go on no, if no, you want going, to. Keep going because I think you forced that on me. That, do you want to stop somewhere uh, no, else? I want, I want to keep going. Oh, you do? Okay. Okay, there. Okay, you yeah. got one? Yes. Has uh, Paul seen it as well? Paul, have you seen it as I well? I can see it, yeah. Great. Right. Okay. Shuffle them again. All right. Remember that card, though. Don't change your mind. It's very important. What I'm going to try to do is look at what you're doing and see if I can discover a tell. That's what gamblers would do in this situation. I've heard of that term with regards to Looking for poker. a tell. Yeah. Okay, okay, in regards to poker. By the way, I forgot the card. <laughs> <laughs> I know what it is. I'm not as dumb as I look. <laughs> All right, this is sounding crazy, but I'm going to try to determine your card just from looking at you a couple of times. <laughs> right. So I'm going to jog some cards Trying up here. To read a tell on me. I am. I'm yeah. going to try to read a tell. Could be any one of these cards. I'm going to show you four cards. And I'm going to assume that the card you took is one of these four. All right. So all I want you to tell me is if it is one, but do not in any way tip your hand and, and tell me what card it is. Mm -hmm. Could be the four, or the ace, or the king, or the seven. The four, or the ace, or the king, or the seven. The four, the ace, the king, or the seven. But you did a subtle little thing uh, on the seven. You, it was very subtle. <laughs> but I thought that it was just enough for me to get it. I'm going to make a definite statement. Your card was the seven, because you had a tell. But well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's very important. The difference between a, a gambler who sees a tell and a magician is this, that if a magician were doing it, that would be a seven, that would be a seven, and that would be a seven. Lovely. Just lovely. Well, uh, uh, if you've ever loved magic or wondered about magic, and by God, I think everybody does, whether it's a part of our childhood or later in life, uh, this is a wonderful piece of work. It's called Deceptive Practice, The Mysteries and Mentors of Ricky Jay, and it opens uh, nationwide in May. And congratulations Thanks on everything, much. and thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Ricky Thanks. Jay, ladies and gentlemen.